Hey you guys, um, uh, I'm here, I'm not in Iowa no more. Here is Lake Havasu, Arizona. This has been six months in the making for Team Sorceress and the cat's out of the bag. Ben Strader from EFI University here met us in Las Vegas when we were struggling racing out there, attempting the world record. He is watching us go down the track, came over to our camp, he essentially was seeing the problems we're having. What was happening was, is as you recall, there's a bolt breaking on an exhaust stand and then the rocker arm would just sit to, simply lay there and we had to put new bolts in and rerun the car. So obviously we had a problem. It was a consistent problem and Ben thought that he could help us and he said, you know what? I want to help you guys. I'm a good guy. I have a great business. I have a lot of technology that I, he goes, I will put the good use and give you the fact and I'll show you what's happening with your motor. Probably be able to show you and tell you how to correct the problem. So I signed right up. I said, hey, let's do it. And so finally, fast forward six months later, here we are. I'm here. I flew in last night from Iowa and we're going to be spending the day here and I'll be right back home. Let's check out EFI University. So I've already been in here a little bit, so I've, I got the lay of the land, and it's cool. It's like the ultimate man cave. If you could just look around a little bit here at the canvas, there's some really cool artifacts here that are real special. Some records, some special notes to uh, Ben Strader at Yetify University, things that he's accomplished along the way. He's in different types of genres. That looks like a little junior dragster, land speed racing some drag racing going on here. He knows a lot about a lot of different things and uh, that's why it's so exciting because I knew it wasn't just a bag of like magical tricks and formulas that would be beyond our reach to understand. So with that, I'm gonna take you real quickly around the shop and probably try to do it in 90 seconds so you get a feeling for what's all happening here and what we're gonna be doing. That's a cool blower motor, the big old Chevy sitting there with the blower on it. It's a dyno room right there. So he does dynamometer testing in here. You'll see a lot of disassembled engines and parts and stuff like that. They're doing inspections. A lot of cool things right here. This uh, really cool magnifying machine that uh, takes parts and you can see them on the screen and, and you can see what's really happening with things instead of just guessing at things. Here, as you see through the window here, here's some uh, electronics that utilizes a software to, to read when a Spintron is running. And um, let's get to the real meat on the bone right here. Here's uh, one of the engines out of the Sorceress. It's hooked up to what they call a spintron. There's an electronic motor that spins it. There's a crankshaft in here, but it's not connected to any rods or pistons. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna spin the motor. We get all the oil on it just like we normally would. The valve's gonna go up and down. The rocker arms are gonna do all our thing. And what he's got is he's got a really high tech laser beam that's planted inside the engine. We've done some modifications. He's gonna explain that later. And what he's able to do is look at things incrementally, you know, in thousandths of an inch, give us a report card, actually what's happening. This motor right now is the same exact parts that we had that we're using in Las Vegas. So we wanna see exactly what's going on. So there's gonna be a couple boogered up little parts that broke out there. We reassembled it, put it back together because we wanna see what's going on here. And we want him to show us what's going on and then we're gonna see how it can be corrected. So this will be where the majority of the time uh, where it's gonna be here is in the spin time room. Without further ado, I'm gonna go and introduce you to Ben. Here's an introduction to Ben here. Once again, I have to tell you that this would never be able to happen if I didn't meet up with Ben at Vegas and we'd still be struggling and honestly guessing and taking straws and see his opinion would be correct. I just can't tell you how happy and excited I am with this program knowing, let, let's apply it to like we all do have in the past like hey listen hey I'm gonna try this new camshaft you kind of get excited about trying something but then deep down you're like boy if it doesn't work I just don't know you always got that thing in here but now we have concrete evidence of what's gonna work what's happening and how we're gonna move forward so that's what I'm just trying to do is show you how excited I could possibly be because of all those things and all those answers and, and questions yet I mean we, what's the real question what's the real answer so Ben here is gonna tell us exactly what we're gonna do is we're gonna do another test here what we're gonna do is a back-to-back -back, and we're gonna see essentially what the change is gonna be Mm -hmm. Yep, so, uh, well, first of all, thanks for letting me work on your, your stuff. This is awfully nice hardware, so I'm sure not just everybody gets to play with it. I appreciate that. But we kind of came in with a plan, right? So let's get it up and running. Let's collect some data on the baseline on the machine. So we were able to do that successfully. So we have both the intake lobe and the exhaust lobes now mapped in our software. We can kind of see where the system's unhappy. Then it was, now that we had that, let's see what else we can do to try to fix it. So our first step was, let's try a different combination of valve springs. So we went in took the valve springs that were on it off, made some measurements on what they were, what kind of install heights they had, took my best guess based on some experience of what I think will get us in the right direction. Then we'll fire back up and we'll collect data there too. But it's really that ability to have back-to-back -back data that we can measure. Like if we can't measure it, how are we gonna manage it, right? Otherwise, we just keep throwing parts at stuff. We're gonna take measurements. And I've done enough of these kinds of measurements where I'm like, I think this needs to go this direction. But rather than say, well, I think this and they think that, and everybody's got an opinion. Now 
now we have the ability to say, I think this, I could be wrong, let's measure it and find out. And that's about what we're going to do. And so what Ben's idea was to try a little softer valve spring. Technically, it's, it's a lot different than what we have. We had a triple valve spring in this thing. The genetic makeup of the size of the coils and the numbers is a lot different. What he's found is just laying here just for something to try, just to see if it's going in the right direction, like he's hedging his bet on. It's a dual spring, correct? Uh -huh, it is, yeah. That I think we're going to lose probably around the neighborhood of about 25% of, or 20 to 20%. About 20%. Percent. We're going to take about 120 20 pounds of spring load off of the seat pressure. So it's a big enough move that we're going to see it change and, and we have some hedged bets here where it's going to change. We're getting excited to spin this up here right now. So yeah, we're not only changing, just so you know, it's not really about the spring force that we're trying to change. We changed the wire diameters, number of coils and the pitch of those coils. What we tried to do is move to a spring that had a higher natural resonant frequency, which means it vibrates at a higher frequency than the old springs did. So the lower the frequency that thing naturally vibrates at, the more likely you are to run into trouble with a given engine RPM that you're at. We want to get to a point where our spring package gets out of control at some RPM that's way higher than we ever intend to go to. If we can do that, then we'll be safe as can be at the RPMs we really want to run the engine at. So that's really our goal. Bouncing off the seat. Yes. So the exhaust side was not doing that yesterday with less with less lash. Now it is. So the intake will probably be way worse. Is it loud enough? It actually is louder than when it's running. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> That's because it has exhaust on it. <laughs> <laughs> Look how flat it gets over the nose and how much bending there's here. Now it's starting to bounce off the seat a bunch. Yeah. See all this. That's at 7,800 right there. That's that number yeah. again, Ben. Yeah. Okay, so we just ran the motor. We got some data here. And let's break this down, Professor. All right. So what we're seeing here is where we're, you can see the RPM here is about 8,300, right? This purple line is the valve lift curve that we had when we were only at 1,000 RPM. So very little effort in the system going on. As you get up here, though, what you can see is that We've now, down here where it's low, we have a lot of bending and deflection in the system because the yellow line shows us how much lift we did not have. We should have been up here at the purple line or white line, depending on how you see it, and we're down here. The problem is we took this thing and we like bent it, and then all of a sudden up here, we let it fly off the top and it cleared the entire nose ramp of the camshaft. Comes all the way over here. If this was Evil Knievel, he just cleared all the school buses, but when he landed, he missed the closing ramp, and boom, it crashed and it bounces right back off the seat. So we have about 18 to 20 thousandths of an inch of bounce here, which is not good. If the valve's open, you can't be sealing the cylinder. So our job designing cams and lobes and valve trains that work together is to manage the demand for airflow that the engine needs by giving it enough time, that's duration and lift, and controlling the kinetic energy that we're putting into the system to get that. We only want as much valve spring as it needs to control this. Oftentimes, people will have problems with their valve train. By people, I mean engine builders who don't have sophisticated test equipment. So you just have to do whatever you do to fix it. So most times when people say, man, I have evidence in one form or another that my valves are not being controlled, what do they do? You put more valve spring in it, okay? The problem with putting more valve spring in it is look what we saw. It was bending the push rod, it was bending the rocker arm, it was bending the rocker stand. Well, you putting more valve spring in it is not helping that problem, it's actually making it worse. So then we just move the problem to some other RPM range when it finally gives up the ghost, but we've made the problem worse everywhere else. That makes complete sense and we're guilty of all the above. Everybody is, trust me. If you didn't have this equipment to measure it, you wouldn't know that. So what we need to do is not find more valve spring or less valve spring, we need to find the correct valve spring for our system. For it would be. So the two things that I would change immediately that would cost the least amount of money and the least amount of effort is I would change the shape of the lobe profile so that the opening ramp here was softer and smoother. 
that would initially try to put less energy into the system. Okay. The second thing I would do is take valve spring out of it, not put more in it. Okay. okay, those two things would cost very little money and very little effort that would fix the vast majority of the opening problem. So you, right now, without even knowing what the valve spring's in there, you wouldn't care whatever it is, you're just going to put less of it in there. Yes, because I, I have data that's telling me that's what I'm right. getting. Yeah. That would not bend as far. Let's say my valve spring has 500 pounds on the seat. Mm -hmm. Well, I see where the problem is. The problem's not up here. The problem's down here off the seat. So if I could go from 500 to 400 on the seat, wouldn't this line bend less? So what else could it be that would allow it to bend in there? Uh, other so than? it may be that we can take all the valve spring in the world out of it, it and the system it. is so flexible because the push rod's okay. too small, the rocker So what would weak. flex that much to do that then? What would be your... The rocker stand is probably the biggest culprit right now with a single bolt holding it down rather than a stand that's tied together. Okay. Okay. So we're not going to fix 100% of that with valve spring and camshaft. Sure. We're just gonna make it like a little more comfortable. I'll show you an example of one of the ones that failed previously. You can actually look at this stand and you can see where this corner is bent up. There's so much force in the system because we're holding it down over here and here, but not over here. You can actually see where this leg is kicked up and it's bent that stand. Correct, that's right. Well, because the shafts are hardened steel here, as soon as you try to bend that shaft, it breaks. And guess what? Now the rocker arm comes off. Okay. Correct. So let's walk over here and I'll show you an example of what our stand's going to look like when we get done. I'll show you what the final product actually looks like here. And so here's my one piece rocker stand now. You can see the individual parts that look just like our plastic piece they made. And they're all tied together to give us stiffness and share the load. So notice that in this stand, there's actually five places that are going to be holding it down. You got the two in the, in the rocker arm here. Now right now, for mock-up, I have bolts in here, but these will be studs that go all the way into the cylinder head through the bottom of the stand. They'll come up and have nuts. So you got one, two, three, four, and then a big nut in the center, five, and then the bar joined all the way across. Imagine if we had that on the Sorceress, wow. we'd, be in, we'd be in Fat City. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. So, so that's so what easy. we're working towards on Sorceress. Yes, that is fantastic. And how exciting, because we know what a finished product is essentially going to look like and what it's going to be and what we need. So when I look at your cam card, intake valve is going to open 26 and a half degrees before top dead center and then it's going to close at 78 and a half. So if we shift that half degree one way or the other, we'd be 26 and 79, let's say. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. so now let's think about that. The valve gets to the seat 79 degrees after bottom dead center. So think about that. Piston goes all the way down. It comes to a dead stop. Now it's going back up in the cylinder for 79 degrees. Now we only have 180 to get all the way back to the top. We just use 79 of them. So we now have 101 degrees left to do the compression stroke. Now keep in mind, we're probably gonna be firing the spark plug. In your case, let's say 20 degrees before top dead center, something like that, right? Okay. So out of my 101, I now lost another 20. So we now only have 81 degrees to do our compression work. However, when we look at what the valve just did, it landed here at 150 and it bounces, doesn't come back to the seat until almost 195 degrees. For 45 degrees extra, the valve was hung open. So out of my 81 degrees I have left, I just lost another 45 of them. Your compression stroke is basically non-existent at this point. So now we have concrete, conclusive data as to why the EFI tune-up is doing what it's doing. It's not the tuner, it's not the turbo, it's the, you don't have Bullshit, I'm blaming on the tuner. Definitely, Shane T blew <laughs> it myself, Shane right? Shane T. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, that's it. I knew it all along. Now we have real evidence that there's nothing that he can do with the laptop to make the engine better if you're not closing the valve. You just can't get there. And by the way, this will get exponentially worse as the valve lash grows, whether you intentionally put more lash or the engine gets hotter and it grows more lash. Because what happens is the design of the lobe here is made to gently start opening the cam. Well, if we have a bunch of lash, that means instead of running along and getting here and going up, I'm waiting until we're up here. And so it's like hitting the valve train with a sledgehammer by having all that lash. You're giving it a run to wind up at it. So for the audience here, we've, we've selected the lash to be as close and accurate as real time right now. Even the motor is essentially cold, if we could call it that. We picked the lash at 26 thousandths. We felt that that's pretty accurate. 
when the motor is running at the racetrack and it may be even as much as 30 degrees. So we chose that on purpose. Prior run to this, we ran it at eight, nine thousandths. We did see a difference in here. So now we also have the data between that two. We don't need to get in weeds for the people watching, but we do see the difference of what that much valve lash does to this program. And it is extreme. I mean, it's yeah. it's to the point where I'm seeing his valves bouncing off of the bottom. It's not even uh, doing its compression thing. Yeah, I mean, if you look, you can see this this blue line up here shows us the valve lift. And so here we're just kind of idling, right? And our valve lift is very stable. As we begin to go up in RPMs though, you see the actual amount of total valve lift here starts kind of going up and down as our spring is surging and it's not controlling us very well. Sometimes at this RPM, it's got enough energy. At this RPM, it doesn't. And so what happens is when we're at idle, we're getting uh, like say 915 as our actual net lift. Over here, it's you know as high as 942. And then you know it kind of goes down 942. Can we freeze right there, Ben? Sure. Okay, so this is not something that we're trying to produce to, to make some silly videos saying, hey, let's run this video uh, and we'll come up with some crazy scenarios and make these things react something that's not realistic. What we're looking at here is, I want to go really slow with this. Sure. This is at 6,688 RPMs. That's about the lowest where we run the car. So when we maybe lock up the torque converter, and it makes a gear shift, it might pull it back to 6,200, 6,400. This is where it's got to grunt, it's got to start doing its work. But if you look closely at Ben's blue line right here, and you can explain a little bit better, Ben, sure. how it's struggling along, and at 7,800, we have a catastrophe that happens, and I don't know if you can re-explain that. So for the next 1,200 RPMs, this thing is in our range where we got to run this motor. So this is where you run the engine most of the time on the track, and it happens to be, of all the stuff we have, the area where it's the most upset in the valve. Isn't plane. that crazy? So it's not like you guys can see this tachometer stuck at 8,000 RPMs. We do have to run it out the back door because of the speed of the car. We just cannot put enough gear in this thing. And by the way, we have a 340 gear in this thing. So if people are saying, well, you gotta take the Ford Levens out of it. Well, we run a 340 gear. It's that when you run 260 miles an hour, and a 36 inch tire, it's a lot of RPM and unfortunately we just can't get away from that. So we do need to understand what's gonna happen, that's why we're running this, and we do see 8200 RPMs at yeah, times. So we went all the way to 85. So, so, so we wanna make sure, so there's nothing that's uh, gonna surprise us in the future. So we do need that data. So what Ben's pointing out is, is right into the heart of this program where we gotta pull this thing down the track at that 6600 RPMs, all the way up to that 8,000, it's like where it's got to do its work and it's doing these funny, crazy things in between there. So let's talk about a little bit about what's happening there. First of all, the Sorceress is a very technologically advanced car and it actually came with variable cam timing. You didn't know that until today though. <laughs> uh, it's a but, Toyota. Yeah, that's right. It's a Toyota, yeah. variable cam. So if we look at our intake duration values over here versus over here, you can see that at the same time our lift is kind of moving around, so is the amount of time that the valve is open. So again, it's going along nicely, then it gets a little mad, and then it gets really mad, kind of all in a hurry, and all in this area where you're working, right? So the lack of valve opening, or the lack of duration, so if you look here, we're at, uh, let's see, let me give you some real numbers. Um, when we're here at 8,500 RPM, we're down around between 200, and about 256 degrees of duration, and then if you look, that number over here at idle, was 268, so it's about 12 degrees smaller camshaft because it's basically bending all of the components in the system rather than opening the valve. So where my purple trace, the distance from here to here was X, you can see the yellow trace has just waited longer. It squeezed all that up, right? Mm -hmm. Now that's one problem. The other problem is all this lift changing all the time. And what that tells you is that we're making the parts move so fast going up that we don't have enough valve spring to keep them in tracing that, that slope here on the nose. And so we get this weird vi variable lift, but also if you look down here at the bottom, is the valve's coming down so fast and it's hitting the seat so hard that it's like an oil can. It goes boop, boop, and the energy in the valve pushes it right back off the seat, except we got this big giant valve spring and this is what's supposed to be holding the valve closed. Why isn't it doing that? Well, here's why. The reality is when we test our valve springs, we get them out of the box and we inspect them and we're happy with them. We go put them in the press over there and we bring them down and we go, okay, it has this much force on the seat. And what I mean by that is when we put the valve spring in, it's compressed a little bit when the valve is at rest. That, that's my seat load or my seat pressure, right? In this case, we have a little over 500 pounds of pressure on the intake side, about 575 on the exhaust side. 
but that's not what we really have. That's only what we have statically when this thing's in the vise. The reality is we're gonna show you guys some footage later in the week when we cut off one of Rod's uh, billet valve covers in there. We're gonna slice it in half and bolt it back on so we can see the springs. And you're gonna see that what happens is Isaac Newton said that an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Well, the spring is an object. And when we get it in motion, these big heavy coils, you start pushing them down really fast and you start letting them go really fast. That spring is gonna take on a life of its own and it's gonna start moving even though we didn't ask it to from the camshaft. Normally the cam lobe comes around, it moves the lifter, the push rod, the rock arm, compresses this as we're opening the valve. And then when we let go of the valve, the spring forces the retainer up and the valve closes. But what would happen when the valve closed if the valve was hitting the seat and bouncing? What would happen if the spring was doing the same thing? What if the spring was sitting here bouncing all by itself? Well, if I was to put my bathroom scale under the spring and have it do that bounce, wouldn't the force be going up and down as well? That's exactly what's happening. So here's what's going on. This thing is bouncing at a natural frequency. The forces are going up and down and up and down at a frequency. What that means is as a specific length of time interval, it's happening. Now, the time interval that we're opening and closing the valve is variable with RPM. At some RPM, the frequency that we're opening and closing the valve will match the frequency that the spring is oscillating, and guess where that happens? 7,800 RPMs. You're getting good at this, Rod. You could have my job anytime. <clears throat> I tell you what, this is a wonderful, this is so hard to grasp because we spend our whole livelihood trying to get things better and literally in minutes, <laughs> we can see exactly why it's not good and what it's gonna to take to make it better. Since there's no pistons or connecting rods, we actually have dedicated test blocks and we'll cut a hole in the side of the block, but Rick just wouldn't let me do that to your block, so he was Rick's not a, he's not a team player. Yeah, buddy. he's just not. So he actually went the extra mile and cut a hole in your oil pan and then welded a tube in so we could take this laser. It's about this big, and later on when we have it apart, I'll show you guys again. The laser goes up inside the cylinder and it's looking up at those valves. So those valves are opening and closing all the time. So the trace that you're seeing on the TV screen is the motion of the valve as measured down to one one thousandth of an inch every single degree that the crankshaft turns. So we're taking a measurement, 360 samples per rotation of the engine of where that laser is displacing and that lets us see what the valve is doing. That's why we can look at it at every single RPM on every single engine cycle. So when we sit here and look at the motors, just sitting here, it's not hocus pocus, it's this laser beam. I thought I seen through a spark plug hole, a reflection probably, of, of the laser beam. You probably can. If you look right down in there, you can you actually can see, see it. Some, some light illuminating yeah, the red glow the, I sure can. There is a shaft that's made and it connects to this electric motor and that, mm -hmm. that electric motor is what's spinning all this. And it takes a lot of energy to do that yeah, because of all the spring pressure. You want to see inside of the spin so, um, wow, so yeah, so you won't want to touch anything in there, but uh, what we have is a giant electric motor. It's a 75 horsepower electric motor that uses 480 volts, upwards of 130 amps, and it spins a belt drive. Now, this is just a straight shaft or what we call a mandrel that goes through here, and that mandrel is ground to have the same exact bearing journals as your crankshaft, and it comes out the front so you can hook up your accessories and all that. You can see the mandrel drive comes in there and it, and it couples to the machine. So what we do is we program a variable frequency drive, which is over there on the wall, for what speed we want to see the engine RPM go. That then commands the voltage output to the motor to drive it to the speed that we want. So we can go up, we can go down, we can do gear changes, we can do whatever we want to program just to see what happens to the valve train or any other part of the engine that we want to spin. So there's other spin trons. I have, myself, I've heard of it before. I, I heard of the term around the NASCAR family. Uh -huh. Is that, is this a little bit different than their spin tron then, Ben? Um, depending on what people have, ours is fairly unique because I built the whole control system and data acquisition for this one using readily available products on the market. Um, I went to a company called Plex uh, Tuning out of Greece they build a really, really nice high-speed data acquisition system that's used for combustion analysis. Normally what they use those for is very high-speed data acquisition of cylinder pressure combustion while the engine's running. So it takes a lot of processing power to measure all that stuff that fast. So I went to them and I said, hey, you know, I have one of your units and we have success with it. Could you redesign the software? Instead of looking at a pressure sensor, could you look at information from my laser? And they said, heck yeah, we'll do that. And 
So we co sort of co-opted the development of that data acquisition side. Now the control side, Spintron is a company that's been around a long time, but they didn't do a lot of development with the control side software. It was pretty old fashioned and kind of, you know, clunky and kludgy to work with. A lot of the older systems out there, they could only do step testing. Eh, this RPM, eh, this RPM, eh, this RPM, take measurements and then plot it all out. Okay. I wanted to be able to replicate the types of runs that you might do on a dyno or on the racetrack or whatever. So I actually came up with a, a solution using an aftermarket ECU, like an engine control unit, a fuel injection system, if you will. And same thing, I approached them about rewriting the software and firmware so that it would just output a voltage command to my variable frequency drive so that I could type in the RPM I want and how long I want that to happen and slope up or down. And so it comes out as a zero to five volt signal that represents zero to 12,000 RPM. I then have a circuit that comes from that to convert that into Instead of zero to five volts, at zero to 20 milliamps of current, which then communicates directly to the variable frequency drive and then drives the engine. The beauty of this though, is that we're not limited to one style of testing. I don't have to do only it's steps. Infinite. Yeah, I can literally take, let's say you have a race pack data logger in your car. I can take your data logger from the track event you just came from and we can recreate that entire lot of over here. Yes, for sure. That, that goes through. And so it's interesting because we've learned a lot about that how the engine behaves during, for example, big transient speed changes like a gear change. You know, you look at, for example, um, a really high winding naturally aspirated car. They have lightweight components. They can zing up real fast. They use like Liberty five speed transmission. So what's interesting is you look at, well, the car might accelerate in low gear at 4,000 RPMs per second because you have so much ratio. But by the time you get to second gear, that's only maybe 3,000 and then two. And by the time you're in high gear, maybe it's only six or 700 RPMs every second, right? Mm -hmm. But what a lot of people don't think about though is when you grab the handle and change gears, it also goes from up here to down here really quick. I have actual data logs from race cars. When you make the gear change, it can be as high as negative 18,000 RPMs per second. Oh, holy lord. Okay. So I just went from going up at four or 5,000 RPMs per second to down at 18,000 RPMs per second. Imagine what your timing gear, your belt, your timing chain, your lifters, your push routes, all those things are going haywire. Never thought of it. During that little moment in time. So we can capture that with our laser data and go, hey, look, this thing's fine if you just did dyno pulls all day. But if you actually want to live going down the track, we got to look at these other things too. So designing our own control system allowed us to kind of do that. Fantastic. You know, that does um, bring up a good question. In, in the Sorceress, uh, most of our fans know that we have a lockup torque converter, and that's it's going to be a commonplace thing. It's an electronic thing, and, and it's so positive that it's brutal in all parts that, that sit behind that engine because they all have to absorb that instant energy. Yep. And um, in the old days, I, I heard the numbers, Ben, that um, when you're pulling backwards on something, you can essentially sometimes double the amount of torque load, you know, because it's, it's loaded up and it's bringing Absolutely. it backwards, you know, it's when things are starting to move forward, it's bringing it backwards. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to find out if we're going 82 or 8400 RPMs, it locks up and pulls it back to 6100 within, we, well, we know that because we have a digital uh, ECU, we could find out how quickly it is and do the math max on That's that right. and see how because when it's locked up, it's it's so violent that we try to slow it up. I think we can pulse the, the signal a little bit and slow, and slow it, down. it down a little bit. Yep. Uh, but we were doing that to, to save the drivetrain and then to, to bite on the tire against sure. the blacktop. But this might be something that it is a whole nother thing to look at. Everything in the system, right? The valve train, the transmission parts, the drive shaft, all those are taking... Well, there's no course. blower belt, so that wouldn't be... That helps. Another, that yep. helps, yeah. Yep. Sure. But even, you know, your timing belt on the camshaft drive, the cam's Good going point. one way and the belt's trying to pull it the other way. You know what I mean? So all these things in the system play into whether or not your valve train stays in control. And so the better we keep the valve train in control, the more power the engine can make because the valves are opening and closing at the right time. And the longer the engine lives because the parts aren't slamming into each other like sledgehammers. Well, thank you for the tour so far. And, yeah. and I know we're about to learn a lot more. And by the way, for everybody here, I appreciate everybody's time because these obviously are, are moments that um, I guess Ben said it best is, you know, it's been an investment. And I think it's been more than that because I've gotten lucky and ran into Ben or he ran, actually you ran into me technically at Las Vegas there. And it's just been so exciting ever since. And I really appreciate everything you're doing, Ben, I'm and I'm EFI University. It's pretty fun, a cool project. And it's even better to come out. And you know, like you said, we were at the track the same day, 
Shane, my buddy, was tuning in your car, and I sent him a text and said, hey, what's going on over there? And he goes, this <laughs> thing's kicking off the rockers. I said, yeah, I saw that. And he kind of said, well, do you have time? Would you come over? And I came over and looked at it. And then, you know, to be able to meet people that I can really mesh with and we get along well, look at the thing and say, I think I know what's wrong. And then six months later, here we are, and we have real concrete data that says 100% yes. that's what's going on. Yes, for sure. So yeah. now we know not only what is wrong, but we know how to fix it. Only good things can come from that. I agree. And, and once again, thank you. And it was nice meeting your family at the track, by yeah. the way. And uh, the journey's only just begun. That's it.